Hi there. Welcome back to ICE. In this video, we're going to talk about AJAX. So what's AJAX and what do we use AJAX for? Well, let me start with an example. This is a, a really um, a mock website, of course, an artificial website, just to illustrate the ideas. Now, if you wanted to, to display something on the left-hand side here, right, you want to fetch some information from the server and show it here. And then you want to fetch some other information from the server and show it here. So if you think of these two as components or parts of the entire web page, you just want to update this part uh, or you just want to update this part. You do not need to update, for example, the, the top part because this banner or if there's a navigation bar or some other information, it's not going to change. It's just this part here and this part here that you want to change. So for instance, you want to create an effect where if the user clicks on something in a menu bar, that information is retrieved. The text was fetched using AJAX. That string is retrieved from the server in real time and then inserted into that part of the page. And similarly, if I click on that, this uh, word, this phrase, it works is retrieved from the server and inserted into that part of the page. And notice that and notice that when inserting the pieces of text uh, into these two parts of the page, the rest of the page doesn't update, doesn't change at all. Right? So how do we do this? Because if you wanted to to reload the entire page just with the with a few new bits, it's going to waste a bit of bandwidth, right? Because you're loading the entire page unnecessarily, right? All you wanted to do is to update this part. And sometimes if the internet connection is a little bit slow, when you reload the entire page, just to have a little bit of it updated, it would cause a flicker in the entire page. So how do you just retrieve the bits that you want from the server in real time, and then insert it into a part of the page without updating the rest of the page. What we're going to see is that there's a JavaScript library that allows you to do that. In fact, it's just a JavaScript object that allows you to do that, and that's AJAX. Okay, AJAX. You'll find that AJAX is not a new technology. It has been around for 10 years now, and it is a W3 standard. So W3.org this is a website that contains web standards like HTTP, HTML, all sorts of web standards are regulated by this organization called W3C or World Wide Web Consortium. And you find that all the latest standards are there and even the, the older standards are there. And you also find proposals for new standards that are different groups of companies, or organizations uh, tend to put up to the World Wide Web Consortium for discussion and so on. So evolving standards as well as, as, well as existing standards are, can be found from this website, w3.org. So if you look at the standardized AJAX from this website, so let's, so here's the standardized version of AJAX and you'll find that AJAX boils down to this object called XML HTTP request and you can see that the draft was last updated in January 2014 so not too long ago even though it started in 2006 and there are books out as as long ago as 2006 but really it has enjoyed a great deal of attention and updates up to 2014 so from that time onwards, it has been pretty stable and a lot of browsers already supports this JavaScript object, XML HTTP request. And you'll find that uh, you can certainly browse this document and look at uh, the key method calls, the key JavaScript method calls that relates to this AJAX object or otherwise called the XML HTTP request object. And there are many examples here. So we're going to run through AJAX and some of the examples in this video. Okay, what does AJAX stands for? It stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. So hence the word AJAX. And we'll see 
XML coming into the picture a little bit later and we'll, we'll, we'll look at XML in, in a lot more detail later on. So you can think of Ajax as a way of designing web pages or at least it's a way in which web pages can be created and we'll look at examples of that which is a little different from how we might design web pages if we weren't using Ajax. And with Ajax, instead of the browser sending the HTTP request to fetch the, the web pages, it is your code, your own JavaScript code using Ajax to retrieve web pages using a HTTP request. So Ajax answers that question. Can you send HTTP requests from within JavaScript program? Well, yes, by using the Ajax object or otherwise known as XML, HTTP requests. But there are some restrictions. For instance, using Ajax, you can only request uh, web pages or objects, for example, images and other data coming from the originating server. So if you download your Ajax code or your JavaScript program, which has Ajax code from server X, the Ajax code downloaded from server X can only retrieve data from server X. So it's kind of a restriction, but good enough for many purposes. Now, HTTP requests are typically synchronous. In other words, once a request is sent, the browser will block, waiting for a response from the server. And while blocked, the browser cannot do anything. For instance, it cannot respond to user actions until it receives the responses from the server. Right? So this is typical, but many browsers now even do this HTTP request asynchronously. Right? So what does it mean to do request asynchronously? Well, once a request is sent, as in AJAX or as in the XML HTTP request object, once a request is sent, the browser doesn't need to block while waiting for the response from the server. It can go on doing something else. That's why it's asynchronous. right? It's free to do other stuff until a response comes back. For instance, it's free to respond to user actions until it is notified of the response. And the Ajax engine, which is part of the JavaScript engine, which is built into the browser, handles this notification. So once a request is sent, your JavaScript code or the browser can be free to do other things. And then once a response to the request comes back, a callback function is then invoked. Now, what's the idea of a callback function that you that is invoked in response to the responses to the request coming back? So, what is this callback function? Well, it's like this. It's like you're trying to contact someone, and you you pick up the phone, you call someone, and you find that that person hasn't answered the call. You got into the voicemail, and then what you do is you leave a message for this person. Please call me back when you're free and that's it and then meanwhile you go and do something else and when the person gets back to you he or she then uh, calls you back using the message that you have provided and then the convert and then you get a response from that person so it is by analogy with that kind of uh, idea that you have this idea of a callback function so in other words, a callback function is a function that is called in response to things coming back from the server, data coming back from the server. The, here's a diagram that shows the difference between asynchronous and synchronous requests. So on the left-hand side, you have a synchronous request where a request is sent and then the server is processing that request. But meanwhile, the the browser or the client is not doing anything, it's blocked. And then when the re request comes back, then the browser or the client is re-enabled and then it receives the response and processes it. Now in the asynchronous case, a request is sent at this point, right? And the server can do stuff. But a registered callback function is also given, right, on the client side so that uh, when a response comes back, that callback function can be invoked. So the server is processing that request, and while it's processing that request, the browser client can do anything. It doesn't block waiting for the request from the server, 
Once the response comes back, then the callback function that has been registered will be invoked in order to process that, that response from the server. Here's an example of a bit of AJAX code that does this. It, it looks overwhelming at the beginning, but I'll talk you through it. So here's a function called make request, which takes a URL as an argument. And once it takes that URL as an argument, it then uh, does a HT this function does a HTTP request to retrieve the data pointed to by this URL. And then that data is then processed within this JavaScript program. So here you have a bit of standard code here. This chunk of code here is pretty much standard to create a HTTP request object. So you notice that you have this line of code here, which says that window.xml HTTP request. Now, XML HTTP request is a built-in JavaScript object, which is associated with the window object in Mozilla and Safari. So if you're using browsers like Mozilla, Safari, and even Chrome, window.xml HTTP request object will be non now if it exists. Right? If it is now, that means AJAX hasn't been implemented for that particular browser. But if it is non now, then window.xmhtv request will return a true value if it's non now. Right? It will be considered equivalent to true value if it's non now. The flow of the program will then go into this line of code here, and which will assign HTTP underscore request an instance of XML HTTP request. Right. So it will assign it to this variable HTTP request an instance of this, which is an XML HTTP request object. If you're in some other browser, i.e., right, namely a Microsoft browser, instead of XML HTTP request object, it is in the ActiveX object. So if it exists, then you create a new ActiveX object with this argument XML HTTP, which will then create a XML HTTP request object stored here. So after this 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 line of code here, whether you are Mozilla, Safari, Chrome, or any other browser, or IE, at the end of the day, HTTP requests HTTP underscore request will contain an XML HTTP request object. But if it doesn't, then you just uh, create an alert box to say give up yeah, because you can't do anything, you can't proceed. That's if this is now. If it's not now, then it goes on to here. And here in this line of code here, on ready state change equals to a function. So it's actually creating a callback function. And this callback function, you can replace this with the name of a function that you define, or in this case, the function is a nameless function which does only one thing, which is to call this other function here, alert contents, passing in a HTTP underscore request object. So this is a callback function which will be called in response to stuff coming back from the server. And this function is registered as a callback function by assigning it into this variable called on ready state change, which is which belongs to the HTTP underscore request object that was just created up there. In the second line of code is a bit of configuring, where you configure the type of HTTP request that you want to use in order to retrieve that particular URL or to retrieve the data pointed to by that URL. So in this case, we are using a get request, and don't worry about this parameter here. And at this point, so it configures a GET request given the URL, and then it sends that GET request. So at this point, after this line of code, a HTTP GET request has been sent to retrieve the object pointed to or identified by that URL. And this may take some time. Right? And there may be JavaScript code that does something else, the browser might does something else, the user might point and click on stuff. and But on receiving the information that is pointed to by that uh, URL, the given URL here from the server, 
this function will be called. So this function alert contents will be called and using the same passing with the argument the same HTTP request object that was used to issue the HTTP request. And then it will check if it is ready. That means the information coming back from the uh, server, is it ready? So, and this is identified by saying that the ready state. Right? Again, this is a variable in the HTTP underscore request object. Ready state equals to four, that means it's, it is ready. And usually it is, would be ready, otherwise the callback function wouldn't be called. And then it checks the status response code from the server in 200 means okay. And then after that, it means that the response is fine. Otherwise, if for instance, if this were, instead of 200, if it was 404, it means what was requested using that URL was not found if this was 404. So now if it's 200, then you create an alert box and showing whatever that has come back from the server. So dot response text is actually a variable belonging to the HTTP underscore request object that stores the, a string containing the entire document that is written by the server with that get request using that URL. Else, that means if it wasn't 200, like, like 404 for instance, where the requested object is not found, then there would be a problem with the request. So you, you just pop up a, a box saying so. So in the same document, let's say, in the same uh, web page, let's say, just continuing down here, you might create a link and notice that this link is created not using the a tag. Right? You remember you have the a href and so on tag for a typical link. So this is a way you can implement a link using Ajax code. So this is a span object and with a bit of styling there so that it looks like a link. And on click, so when you click on a span object here, make a request and click on the span object, it will then call this function with that argument and that URL is actually this URL here to make a request. So, and you can go to this page to uh, look at how it works. So that's what it looks like, right? So that's the span object here. And you notice that I've made it look like a link, right? Because of my bit of uh, CSS kind of styling here. So you notice that cursor is colon pointer. So when I move the mouse over it, you notice it changes right? from an arrow, it changes to a pointer, right? That here. And text decoration is underlined. You can see this text underlined. So it's really like a link. And when I click on it, it will call this function make request with the given URL. So here we go. And so on. It works, right? So that's, in fact, uh, it's pointing to, to, in this example, it's pointing to something a bit different instead of the Lattro uh, web page. So you can, uh, let me just show you the page source. So it's actually retrieving uh, that particular uh, page. Okay, so it's retrieving, instead of the Lattro websites, actually, I've uh, used homepage.cs instead of www. But you can certainly try it out with www and so on. So asynchronous downloading. So the user doesn't feel that he or she has lost control. The page is still responsive while the data is being downloaded in the background because it's asynchronous. And as I mentioned earlier in the example, you don't see a flicker because only the part of the page that you want to update is reloaded. And there's greater efficiency because only the portion of the page that needs to be updated is downloaded and reloaded. So, but it does encourage different way to decompose a website. That means you would have one HTML page that represents the represents the homepage, let's say, and then you have chunks of data on the server side correspond to different parts of the page. So instead of having a set of HTML pages, you would have one HTML page plus chunks of data that would go into different parts of the page. So a slightly different way to decompose a website in terms of the implementation side of things. Okay, so I've already shown you the standard. You can certainly go have a look there and browse. But basically, XMHTB requests, right? 
is really just an object with standard set of methods. Right? So a standard set of methods here. So remember, we created an instance of this and used these methods in the code, like open, send. And we use these variables, response, text, ready, state, and so on. So if we go back to that code, you can see we use those where we created an instance of this using new HTML HTTP request object. And then we use the variables like on ready state change, ready state. We use the the methods. We use the methods like open, send, and so on. And we also use the, the variables like response, text, ready state, and so on, which are all here. Response, text, ready state, status, and these methods are all here. So here's the pictorial view of what has happened, right? So with each line of code that we saw, we create an instance of the object which initializes uh, the HTTP request object, create an instance of that. And then we, we configure it by two steps. One is to set up a callback function. Let's call it handler in this case. And then we configure the type of HTTP request that we want to use. Once it's configured, we then send it. And this is the actual sending of the get request to the server. And then we wait for a response. When the data arrives, we call that callback function. And then we can get rid of the object at the end of it. And you can see that why the code 4 is used. Uh, this number 4 here has significance. If we go back to here, you notice that when a ready state equals to 4, what does that mean? Well, 4 actually means that the data transfer has been completed, that is actually loaded. Okay, so. We have, used, we have seen get and post requests and in the HTTP standard, in the World Wide Web standard, there are other requests like put to, instead of getting something from the server, we want to put something in the server. Instead of getting everything, we just want to get a header information, a meta information about documents. For instance, we want to get the size of it, we want to get the type of the contents. And then delete is to delete something. And, and usually these are the types of HTTP methods are not implemented, not supported by the server. Normally, we do not want to use these methods to update stuff on the server, but rather we use uh, a program, uh, use a PHP script to do so, which we will look at later. Options is just a catch-all, right? So if all of this doesn't work, then uh, use this. So in general, we just use get and post for the HTTP methods. Now, remember that URL is, is relative. If you have the Ajax uh, web page in this directory, when you retrieve something just by using data.txt, it's going to be in the same directory as the file that contains that code. So data.txt expands to that, and slash index.html expands to that, and this would expand to something like this. Right? So let's look a little bit deeper at that code. Uh, so we already looked at the ready state equals to 4, status equals 200, what all that means. And then you then create alert boxes to either show what's in there or to pop up an error message. So instead of displaying it, like using an alert box like is here, instead of getting the response and, and showing it in an alert box, what we might want to do is to insert it into the document. And each part of the HTML document can be referenced using an object, as we will see later. And each part of the HTML document in the DOM model, there's a variable called inner HTML. Right? So when you assign something into the inner HTML variable of pointed to by this particular reference, you are inserting something into the HTML page. And we'll look at examples of that. So you can get the information that is has been returned by the server using these two variables. If it is normal HTML or just some data in, in free text form, it will be stored in the variable called response text. If it is in the XML format, it will be stored in a variable called response XML. And we'll come back to examples using response XML. So here's an example, basically, extracting information from an XML document and then displaying it. Okay, so you can see this, these are the two variables that we were talking about before. 
Okay, let's look at an example where we fetch some information and insert it into the part of the page. So the first thing you do is, and this is the example that we saw right at the beginning of this video. This is kind of looking behind the scenes. Right? So you can also look at the source code of that example. Now, if you look at this uh, example here, the portion of the page that you want to be replaced, in this case, is actually that string here, the fetch data will go here, is marked up using a div block and is given an ID. Right? And the reason why you mark this up and close it within a, a div block and give it an ID so that you can identify that portion of the page. In JavaScript, if you wanted to get a, a programmatic reference to, to this block here, to this part of the HTML page, you assign to it the result of get element by ID. So get element by ID is a method that is that comes with the document object. So it's part of the DOM method calls. So document dot get element by ID with the div ID and suppose div ID is target div. That will return a reference to this block. If we look at this code here, so there's a button for implementing the display message left that we saw previously. So when you click on that button, it will call get data using uh, data.txt as the data source and target diff as the block that where the retrieved information needs to be inserted into. So that's uh, target diff. That is the diff ID value here. And then you configure the XML HTTP request object and you set up the callback function here. So this is a function, again, is a nameless function, but the contents of the functions here, which is just this few lines of code. And if the steady state was four, that means it's loaded. And status is okay, that means it successfully retrieved the information pointed to or referred to by the data source variable here, which is actually in this example, data.txt. In other words, it's retrieving the contents of data.txt and then inserting it into uh, this block. How is the insertion done? Well, we get whatever that is retrieved, that is the contents of data.txt, which is stored in the variable XMHD request object dot response text. And that information is assigned into obj dot inner HTML. So the inner HTML variable corresponding to that object. Remember, o obj is actually a reference to this block, which would because of this statement here. So what this does is to take whatever is that is in data.txt and assign it into this block. So it will replace whatever that's inside here. And we saw that in an example right at the beginning of this video, that this block here has, has been replaced. Again, if we come back to that example, you can see what has happened here, right? So display message left, right? So it's actually here. So when you click on it, uh, it will call this met this function here, right? It will retrieve whatever that is in data.txt, right? So let's click on that. And what's in data.txt is, is this text here. This text was fetched using Ajax. So in fact, we can, we can take a look at that. What's in data.txt? And you can see this is the information stored in data.txt. Right. So that's the information in uh, data.txt, right? And it's fetched using Ajax, and that is actually uh, inserted in here. So this text is what is stored in uh, data.txt, right? In here, it's fetched using Ajax and inserted into this portion of the page. When you click display message left. And you can actually look at the source code corresponds to that. So that's the get data. So that's the get data function. And that's the code we just saw. And that's the target div, which corresponds to that part here. Now, if you are retrieving XML contents, instead of retrieving information from a text file like data.txt, you may instead retrieve an XML document, and then you can extract information from that. 
Well, an XML document allows information to be stored in a very structured form. So here's an example. You click on this again, you're emulating a link and get guess looks like this. It's config is creating an XML HTTP request object like before, this bit in yellow, and then configuring it, and then setting up a callback function, and then sending the request. So you notice that instead of response text, you have response XML because we know in this case that the information coming back from the server is an XML document. It's not just any piece of text. And then to process what comes back, we assign it into this variable called XML document and we pass it into this other function that we will that we define. And that's the display guest function that is called here to process the XML document. And you find that an XML document contains information that looks a bit like a tree structure. And we will certainly come back to XML in, in, a, in a couple of weeks. But you can see that there are some variable names or instance variables that you can use to navigate around the tree. And in fact, what we are doing is when you look at the first child, last child, siblings, you are basically navigating down the tree and fetching this text, Gary and Grant. So you're actually navigating down the tree. So for instance, event node is events node dot first child. Events node is actually the root element. So the root element is here. Event node, events node dot first child is actually here, right? Because it's the first child of events. And then what is the last child of the event node? The last child of the event node is this people node. So the last child of the people node is actually the person node. And then the first child of the person node is the first name node. Right? And then the next sibling of the first name node is actually this. So you're extracting carry and grant. And that's the value that's actually extracted there. And that value is then assigned or inserted into part of that HTML page. So you can take a look at the result of that. So get the main guess, you should see carry grant, right? Because carry grant is extracted from the XML document. So if you wanted to look at the XML document, it looks a bit like this. There you go. You can see that carry grant is here, and you can see this tree structure, similar to this tree structure depicted graphically here. Alternatively, first name node is actually the first child of the last child of the last child of the first child of the root. So, you know, the first child of the last child of the last child of the first child of the root, right? And similarly with the last name node. And you can see that this target div is actually that part of the document that has been replaced. Okay, so we're going to come back to XML later, but just like you have a DOM for a HTML document, you can have a DOM for an XML document, and you can navigate that object, the data structure, which corresponds to the XML document using uh, all these attributes or variables that we saw earlier on the previous slide. So the idea is that you have a data structure that's created in JavaScript corresponding to a HTML document. You also have a data structure, a tree-like data structure, created whenever you retrieve an XML document in and wanted to process it in JavaScript. But there are other ways to navigate. If you wanted to look at a third first name node, then you can say first name notes two, right? Or wanted to look at the last name node, the third last name node, because it's an array of first name nodes or array of last name nodes, you can use the referencing using arrays. So it's a tree-like data structure that can be updated or navigated from within JavaScript, not just for navigation or for reading, but for writing. Attributes and methods of such data structure is actually a W3 standard itself. And you can go to that website that shows the DOM data structure. So if you like, the HTML DOM is actually an instance of the XML DOM because XML is more general than HTML. If what comes back from the server is just not any arbitrary string, but it is an XML document, we can retrieve it using response XML. Because what would then be 
found in this variable XML document would be the tree-like data structure or the XML dome for that particular XML document that has come back from the server. So the browser will get the XML document from the server, convert it into a tree-like data structure, and then the a pointer to the root of this tree-like data structure is then stored in response XML and is then assigned into uh, this variable here, XML document. And from then on, you can navigate this entire tree-like data structure using this variable XML document, as we have seen. But we will come back to XML later. So you have the JavaScript HTML DOM, which is a W3C standard, and then you also have what has been called level 2 core DOM. What we have seen is that Ajax gives us a way to structure a website. Instead of a collection of .html files, we may only have one .html file, together with a collection of .txt files, for instance, or a collection of .xml files, for instance, that contains different data that would be inserted into different parts of the home page. So we'll look at examples of that later on. So AJAX stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML, although you can actually use AJAX without using XML, as we have seen. And there are other examples. There are many examples of the use of AJAX. Google, for instance, when you type in a keyword, it tries to look for expansions of that search keyword. And it uses AJAX to retrieve different expansions of that particular keyword that you are typing. In other words, for keyword completion, query keyword completion, you can see AJAX being used for that purpose.